In Psalm 42, David wrote, As the deer panteth for the water, so our soul longeth after thee. And I honestly, in my heart, believe that that is exactly where worship should begin. We're back in a living room, mock-up, uh, using video and audio to minister to those that we can. And if you're with us today at Calvary South Cheyenne, we're very thankful you're here. Now, things are about to change. They're starting to let us uh, meet together a little more. And we have uh, rented a building, the Orchard Valley Community Center, which is off of First Avenue, which is just west of Waterside and College. And you make a left off of College just down that street about four blocks. And so if you're in the community and you'd like to come and see us, we would love to have you. We'll be meeting there at 10 o'clock on uh, Pentecost Sunday, which is May the 31st. In the meantime, once again, we're going to ask you to continue to be encouraged, to be in the Word together. We have these Bible studies that are going on uh, through the week. We have prayer, and uh, we've already got that information out there for you. Uh, you're welcome to get on our website at uh, calvarysouth.org, and the information is there for you. If you need to give us a call, the phone number is also there, so uh, I just pray that uh, this would be a blessing for you. That When I was playing the harmonica just now, it was kind of to set a something up that's on my heart, and so I'm going to include this with uh, announcements this morning and then we'll get into to, uh, communion and into the Word. But as we get ready to restart the church, and what a great day to restart on Pentecost Sunday. Uh, we've been studying the Pentecost now for several weeks, but it's the, it's the first fruit, the Feast of First Fruits. And what a beautiful thing that we could start on that day. Um, there are some things going on in the world right now that may have you a bit anxious. As we look at the economy, the um, the government and the way things are being done. They're talking about these vaccines for, uh, for the COVID-19 and all the different things that are going on. We could certainly be beyond rest, but Jesus would encourage us that our rest doesn't come from what's going on around us. You know, when a ship goes through the water, it doesn't leave behind a print. The navigator has to use the stars to navigate the ship. And, you know, I think it's kind of that way with us, too. When the Lord moves through lives, he doesn't necessarily leave footprints. But he's always there. And if we'll just look up, we can see him. And by seeing him, we can navigate these troublesome times that are amongst us. Be of good cheer, he said, for I have overcome the world. And so as we get out into this, and there's one more thing I want to share, um, do not forsake the gathering together of the brethren. We're opening up the fellowships, and I know that we're going to continue video ministry, and you're certainly welcome to partake of that video ministry, but don't become so comfortable in it that you start backing off from being in fellowship with other brothers and sisters. We want you to continue to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you can get knowledge by reading the Bible or listening to a Bible teacher. But I honestly believe that grace comes in fellowship as we learn to live with one another. Remember Proverbs tells us, Proverbs 15.1, that a soft word turns away wrath. And the only way that I'm going to have that interaction, that growth, is if I'm with other people, other brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I encourage you, we're not wanting you to put yourself or your family in danger in any way. But as the Lord leads and as we continue to walk out of this situation that we're in right now, I pray that he would also give you a boldness and, and a protection that you might be able to come together with confidence. And so with that in mind, I'm going to ask Doug to uh, take us out into worship. Now, as I was sharing just a moment ago, um, this, I, I was playing this harmonica like, like I'd be sitting in a living room. It, the harmonica is the only reed instrument that you play both on the inhale and the exhale. You're literally breathing worship. And the words of that psalm, as the deer panteth after water, so my soul longeth after thee. As we get back to worship today, let everything else pass away. 
and let's magnify the Lord together. Doug, would you take us out? the Lamb was slain. Holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven mercy seat. Sing that again. Worthy. Worthy is the Holy, holy is He Sing a new song To Him who sits on Heaven, mercy, see oh, Holy, holy, holy Is the Lord God Almighty was and is and days to come with all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings you are my everything and I will adore you Blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you, the only wise King. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. All creation I sing Praise to the King of Kings You are my everything And I will adore you
Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is, Is anyone, anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? <clears throat> the Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He's David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Of all blessing and honor and glory Is He worthy of this? He is Does the Father truly love us? He does Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And is Jesus our Messiah? Hold forever those he loves. He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. All together, is anyone worthy? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's brood and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. From every people and tribe, from every nation and tongue, he has made us a kingdom and priest to God to reign with the Son. Is He worthy? Is He worthy of all blessings and honor and glory? Is He worthy? Is He worthy? Is He worthy?
Like a vow that is tested Like a covenant of old Your love is enduring Through the winter rain And beyond the horizon With mercy for today Faithful you have been And faithful you will be you pledge yourself to me, and it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips. Ever be on my lips You father the orphan Your kindness makes us whole You shoulder our weakness And your strength becomes our own you're making me like you, clothing me in white, bringing beauty from ashes, for you will have your bride, free of all her guilt, and rid of all her shame, and known by her true name, and it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips. Ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, he you will be praised, he you will be praised. With angels and saints we sing, worthy are you, Lord. You will be praised, you will be praised. With angels and saints we sing, worthy are you, Lord. You will be praised, you will be praised. With angels and saints we sing, worthy are you lord you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you lord and it's why i sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips Ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Every week we celebrate communion together, and as we celebrate the communion, um, we, can, we can teach exegetically about it, but I want to keep this very concise today because I think the Lord has given us a full plate in the Word. And so I encourage you, take some elements, some juice, and a cracker or some bread again. Uh, pray over those. Remember that this is representative of the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. We at Calvary are starting to do this every week. We want to be remembering the Lord and his gift every week, but also for you. You can do this with your family at any time. You can do it at a special meal, a birthday, or an anniversary. What a wonderful thing to bring the Lord into our relationships in our daily lives through this sacrament that he's given us and said, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me.
Okay, we're back again. Uh, thanks for the worship. Uh, I did want to mention one other thing. We are going to do a little cleanup on the building that we're going to be using. And we're going to try to do that on Saturday the 30th. And if you're part of Calvary South Cheyenne, we'll try to get a letter out. But uh, if you could help us alongside of that, so that, that building was ready for us on Sunday the 31st, that would be a great thing. We're in the book of Acts this morning the third chapter, and we're going to begin at the first verse. Let's just begin. Now Peter and John went together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on them with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. And Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength, so that he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at all that had happened to him. Now as a lame man who had was healed held on to Peter and to John, all the people ran together to them in the porch which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why do you so intently look at us? As though by our own power of godliness we had made this man walk. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you deny the Holy One and the just and ask for a murder to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. Let's pray. Father, we pray that today we would be the witness that through the knowledge of your word, by the power of your spirit, though we may have come and been sat at the beautiful gate expecting uh, some other blessing, Lord, that we today would simply be touched by your hand, that we may be um, in want for things that are going on in our lives, things that are awry. But Lord, there is something that more than physical need is met here today. And that is intimacy with you. And so we pray, Lord, through the knowledge of your word, that you would be with us now. In Jesus' name we pray, and the saints of God said, Amen. So we'll walk through this. Now Peter and John went together to the temple at the hour of prayer. In Psalm 55, it says, Evening and morning and at noon I will pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. For Peter and John... This was a common thing, and it would have been for the other apostles also. You see, uh, they did not leave behind the Jewish faith. They saw Jesus as the answer to the Jewish faith. And so, as we saw in chapter 2, Peter's witness was to them from the Old Testament, showing Jesus to be the fulfillment. And when they broke the bread... It was the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they prayed the prayers, it would have been prayers that would have been common to them that they had been praying would come to pass and now had come to pass. And so there was this excitement as they prayed. And then uh, they had things in common. They ministered to one another. And we don't know how long that goes on. We don't really know Um, Was this a week, two weeks, a month? But Peter and John, as was their custom, and the others also probably, would be going back to the temple and continuing in prayer. It's interesting to me that it's Peter and John. From now on in the gospel or in the book of Acts, that's the way we'll see them referred to. And I believe that what we're seeing there is that the Lord is lifting Peter up in leadership as he's under the submission of the Holy Spirit. It's interesting that they were not called Christians at this time. They were Jewish believers. They were believers in the Lord Jesus Christ who had also espoused the 
the Old Testament writings. And so they were Jewish believers. They would not be called Christians until about the middle of the book of Acts. Actually, I think it's the 11th chapter and about the 26th verse where it it says that they were first called Christians at Antioch. Now, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. We're about to see a miracle. And the miracle, and, and this is something I want you to see, the miracle was not just for the sake of the miracle, but it, it would add authenticity to their teaching. When Jesus sent out the 70, he sent them out with authority. Why? That they would be able to add authenticity. Jesus' miracles. When he walked on water, he didn't walk on water and then pass the hat. He walked on water to show who he was, that he had authority. In John chapter 10, verses 37 and 38, Jesus speaking says, If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe in the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. The miracles that Jesus done, that's what he's talking about here. I want you to make note. I'm going to have three things to make note of today. I want you to make note of this. And this believing brings hope and comfort. Believing in the things that the the Lord spoke and the signs and the wonders that they saw. When John the Baptist had sent to Jesus, he was in prison. John was in prison and he sent to Jesus and said, Are you the one or do we look for another? And in John chapter 7 verse 22, Jesus answers and says, Tell him the blind see." The deaf hear, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed. Blessed is the man who is not offended because of me. What he was saying was, John, have hope. Be comforted. And that comfort would literally take John to his martyrdom. He died with absolute confidence that he had invested himself in the true Savior of the world. So very important, saints. In John chapter 3, verse 2, Nicodemus says, And there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. A man, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So the signs once again were manifest. Now we see that given to the apostles and even Paul the apostle, not even, but Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 says, Truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. These things were once again there, and I believe even today, God is working miracles in people's lives so that we can be seeing his glory and be comforted in his words of hope. The author of Hebrews, uh, in reminding them of uh, the excellent witness of the apostles, said in Hebrews chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, Therefore we must give more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through the angel proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we ne- neglect so great a salvation? which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed by those who heard him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders and various miracles and the gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. See, these gifts of the Holy Spirit are what we are talking about today. It wasn't simply uh, the speaking in tongues or the interpretation of tongues or magnifying and glorifying God with that gift. But there were gifts beyond that. And I think that when Paul speaks in 1 Corinthians, he says, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, if I have not love. You see, when Jesus healed the leper, when we look back in in the Gospels, and it says, and Jesus moved with compassion. That's love. God loves us. 
Jesus loved the leper. For the saints in the church today, the fruit of the Spirit should be that we love God and that we love one another. And then from that, that we give God license to do whatever he wants to do in our lives. And we're submitted to that. I think we have to be careful sometimes, though, that we don't start to try to put God in a box and say, well, if you're God, I want this or I want that. Remember that as we pray, it is thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So here in this case, we find the man brought and, and set at the, at the uh, temple at the gate beautiful. Very interesting place. Uh, I don't have a lot of time to get into it, but if you were to draw a rectangle and say that that was the holy place and the holy of holies, and then outside of that was the courtyard of the, of, of the men and the priests. And then beyond that was another courtyard called the courtyard of the women. The gate that separated the courtyard of the Gentiles from the courtyard of the women or the courtyard of offerings or the courtyard of benevolence is the beautiful gate. And it was called Nacor's gate. And I don't know, Nacantor, I'm sorry, Nacantor was the gate. And uh, it's very interesting. They say that these this gate was made out of Corinthians bronze and that it took 20 men to open and close that gate. And so it's outside of this gate that this man would be sitting. This was the perfect place to sit because inside of that, in the court of the women, they would receive up to 13 different benevolent offerings. And I'll talk about that a little bit more as we go on. But it's just interesting to me that this man would set himself in such a place or somebody would set him there that people who were coming to worship God with a joyful heart, wanting to bring forth offering, would see him. And so I believe that that's part of why he was expecting from Peter and John the gift of, of, of a token. He didn't go there that day to be healed. He went there to have his material needs met. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go on. It's also interesting to me that this Nicantor, uh, we don't know a lot about him. We know that he was a Jew from Alexandria. But recently on the Mount Olivet, they found a ossuary that has, these are the bones of Nicantor who contributed to the, gold, or to the beautiful gate. So it's very uh, neat how we find things and it authenticates God's word. I don't think it's necessary that we have things to authenticate it, but I believe that these are once again those things that draw nails, drive nails in the coffin of disbelief in our lives. We find these things, it's not surprising to us. It's, it's actually comforting. Now, it's also interesting to me that he sat at this gate. I don't think this was a one-time thing. And this was not the first time that Peter and John had come to that gate at the ninth hour, the, the hour of prayer. Remember that it was the ninth hour when the veil was torn in two from top to bottom. It was the ninth hour when Jesus said, it's finished, take the less thy. But now, at the ninth hour, the custom, one of the customary hours of prayer, this man would be sitting there, and, and if Peter and John were what we've just spoken of, uh, practicing their faith in Christ Jesus along with their Jewish heritage, they would have been there regularly for prayer. We saw that in Psalm 55. And so, how many times had they walked past this man? How many times? Could it be that Jesus may have even walked past this man? And why was he never healed before now? You know, these are things that you quiz yourself about, but then again, I come back and I say, you know, the Lord has his hand in this. And in the midst of this, we read it 2,000 years later and we see the absolute wonder, the majesty, uh, the perfect timing of the Lord. I've said before, you know, Jesus didn't heal everyone in need. I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of John, chapter 5. Um, and I want to share with you a situation where we see uh, just this very thing happening. John, chapter 5. And uh, I'm going to be picking up oh, right there at the beginning of the chapter. And there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called Bethesda having five porches. 
In these lay great multitudes of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. This was an area that would have been very common in that day where numbers of people could have been gathered together. And as was their custom, if the water was moved, they say it was moved by an angel and the first person into the water would be uh, healed, would be touched. For an angel went down at a certain time to under the pool and stirred the water. And then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease they had. Now a certain man was there who had had an infirmity 38 years. That's a very interesting number to me. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it today. But if we go by the timeline of Sir Robert Anderson and Jesus was in fact crucified in 32 AD and the temple was leveled by Titus Longimaeus in 70 AD, 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, he knew that he already had been in that condition for a long time. And he said to him, do you want to be made well? And the sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. And the Jews therefore said to the man who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. Now, if there were a multitude of people there who were waiting for the water to be stirred, who were in need of healing, Jesus walked through those people. And yet he touched this man. He healed this man. And then after that, he would have walked back through that same crowd of people. Now, this man is confronted by the priest. If Others had been healed, they also would have been confronted. But we see Jesus heal one man. I believe that it was the perfect timing of the Lord as a witness. God doesn't, and listen, this is another note for you. Um, Jesus doesn't heal everyone in need. That's what we see here. But along with that, I want you to get a hold of this. Jesus doesn't heal everyone in need. But Jesus does, however, heal everyone in need who comes to him. That's a big one, guys. Let's look at verse 4 and 5. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said to him, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. He expected to receive an offering. He expected to receive a, something to, for, to provide for the moment. And sometimes when we get to church, why are we there? Are we there to truly seek Jesus? Or are we there to meet a friend? Or are we there, you know, what is the reason that we're there? In this man's case, he came to the temple. I don't believe he came to worship God. I believe he came because he knew it was a place where he could receive a ministry, be ministered to physically. Let's look at verse 6 and 7. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Wow. And he took him by the hand, by the right hand, and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked, entering the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. <laughs> Man, a couple of things here. First, uh, can, you, can you get a picture for this? Uh, it's an amazing, amazing moment. For this man, his heart must have stopped in his chest as Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. He wasn't saying he didn't have silver and gold. They were going into the beautiful gate where they would receive offerings. I believe they probably had silver and gold with them. But it was not silver and gold that this man needed. It was something far greater. It was the healing. It was the touch of God. It was an eternity in the balances. What a glorious day. Oh, happy day. There's that old song, Oh, happy day. When Jesus washed my sins away. 
Silver and gold I do not have. It's a, there's a story, and, and a, it's a historical story, of a Flemish priest who wrote a uh, commentary about the Catholic Church. And uh, there was a Thomas Aquinas who was in service to Pope Innocent II and came upon Pope Innocent actually counting money into the treasury. And uh, as he was doing that, he said to Thomas Aquinas, we no longer like Peter can say, silver and gold have I none. Aquinas' answer was, that may be so, Holy Father, but we also do not say rise up and walk. Listen very closely. Wealth does not always lend itself to faith in God. Wealth sometimes takes away our faith. We get to where we rely on wealth instead of the Lord. Throughout history, listen very closely, throughout history, when the church has traded purity for prosperity, she has lost her power in Christ. You see, when they came and they touched him, this man needed more than money. He doesn't even realize his actual need. Peter and John, however, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I believe, do see it. They're being led by the Spirit. And in this moment, Peter is is moving in the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's seen it happen time after time. I want to share with you too, It wasn't this man's faith. This man didn't come in faith to be healed. He didn't come. He came, as I've said before, for an offering, for substance for a day or maybe a couple of days. He'd have to come back to that gate again. Now, in just a minute, we see him coming to his feet. We see his body restored, and we see him enter the golden gate, or the beautiful gate, with Peter and John. Now, Peter and John may have had an offering. There were 13 offerings, as I said, inside of that gate, and they may have had offerings for for one benevolence or another. Maybe this man had a few tokens that he had been given through that day. Could you see him emptying out his pockets now and saying, I don't need this anymore? I've got Jesus. He has restored me. He has strengthened me. I came with nothing, and he's given me everything and forgiveness. I, uh, I'm very humbled by that. You see, what he's doing right there is this testimony. He is walking and leaping. He's literally bubbling over in the presence of others who had just come and they loved God and they were trying to do the right thing and now they're seeing the glory of God poured out over this man and now bubbling over from him onto everybody that's there. You know, there's an old saying, you can tell what's in your cup whenever you get bumped by what spills out of it. And in this man's case, nothing but the love of the Lord And so we're going to go on here in just a minute, but they're right now inside the beautiful gate. In just a moment, they're going to come out of the beautiful gate and literally he's going to continue this kind of an action, this, this proclamation, this witness. And then they're going to be out in the court of the Gentiles and they're going to end up over to the side in a place called Solomon's Colonnades or Solomon's Porch. This is where Jesus taught. This is where the woman who had been caught in adultery would have been brought. What a powerful, powerful thing. In Ephesians, so what we're seeing here is the work of the church. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, it says, the purpose of the church is for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. That was this man's testimony. And he didn't even realize it. He didn't set out to, he said, oh, I'm going to go out and, and grow saints in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. And in that, the church is going to be built up. It's going to be edified. What's happening is his testimony becomes the edification for the church, the building up. I want you to look at chapter 3, verse 6 again, and it says, 
and uh, then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Yeshua Mashiach Hanadarim. No other name. He was Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus the Nazarene, Jesus the Christ, the Mashiach, the Deliverer. He wasn't Jesus from some other place. He wasn't Jesus from Bethany. He wasn't Jesus from... He was the one who had been set aside for the use of God. You know, some people say, um, well, let me say it this way. If you believe in any other Jesus, you're not saved. If you believe that Jesus was the brother of Lucifer, you're not saved. If you believe that Jesus was an angel, you're not saved. If you believe that Jesus was a prophet like other prophets, you're not saved. You say, well, Randy, that's that's kind of narrow-minded. No, that's Christ-centered. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of John again, the 8th chapter. The 8th chapter, I'm going to be picking up at the 21st verse. You see... The Jews, the religious leaders of the day were trying to poke holes in who Jesus was. And he's going to answer them. I'm going to be picking up at verse 21. I'll get there in just a second. Read with me if you would. John chapter 8, verse 21. Then Jesus said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Because he says, where I go, you cannot come. And he said to them, you are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you, you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. If you've got your Bible out right now, if you're reading in ESV, if you're in NASB, if you're reading NIV, if you're reading NKJV, he is italicized. It wasn't there in the original text. That's very, very important because he says, if you do not believe that I am, the becoming one is what that means, the the one you need when you need, the one who's going to take care of every situation perfectly, the I am, the creator of heaven and earth, then you're going to die in your sin. You see, there are a lot of people out there today that are teaching a gospel that is not the true gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Yeshua Mashiach Nazarene. No other name, no other name given on earth or in heaven by which men must be saved. When Moses was called by the Lord to lead the nation of Israel out of bondage and into the the promised land, He, in chapter 3 of Exodus, said, Lord, I'm willing to do this, but who is the one who is sending me? And God spoke to Moses and he said, you tell him the I am. The I am. So when Jesus says this, the Jews knew exactly what he was saying. And you say, well, Randy, let's go further on. Look to the same chapter, turn to verse 57. Verse 57. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? See, the Jews were trying to make Jesus uh, an itinerant rabbi. They were trying to make him somebody that he was not. He was, in fact, the Son of God, God incarnate. Show us the Father, the apostles would ask. And he would say, have I been so long a time with you? He who has seen me has seen the Father. Last week I shared with you guys about what it is to be involved in ministry in our homes and in our churches and in our communities. And we say, well, how can I be a better father, a better wife, a better student? Read your Bibles. Understand that this is what God wants for you. But if we simply try to make him another Jesus, you'll not get what you've asked for. 
Verse 58, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. The he isn't there. Back over here again, as we continue on, and I need to keep moving for sake of time. But I want you to see another note here. This man came to the temple not really to be healed, not to be touched by God, not to be delivered from sin. He had become comfortable in his routine. Somebody's going to pick me up. Somebody's going to leave me at the temple gate. Somebody's going to love me. Somebody's going to provide for me. And I'm going to do the same thing tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. Why do we come to church? Why are we set at the temple? Do we come here to network? Are we here because our friends are here? Do we come here, and this happens, do we come here to find a mate? Do we come here to take advantage of others within the body? Oh, we don't say we're doing that, but we we come here not really to seek the Lord. And yet, and, and understand something, this guy didn't come, it wasn't his faith that healed him that day. It was God's grace. You know, God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, he gave us his grace. And some people are going to come to church this, this day, some, of the, some folks may be watching this, and God wants to move in your life. He wants to give you the ability to stand and to walk and to run and to leap and to praise God. <laughs> Everybody around him is seeing this. Look at, look at, let's move on. Let's see, verse 9, and we've already read it. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms in the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at all that had happened to him. He was bubbling over with the joy of the Lord. He was bubbling over with what God had done in his life. And now it's spilling over, as I've mentioned already. There's a song the kids love to sing. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Opens prison's doors and sets captives free. The man that wrote that is a man named Lewis Casebolt. I don't think he could have wrote it if he hadn't felt it. If he hadn't experienced it. And I believe sometimes, folks, we take that song and we hold it instead of letting go of it. We are blessed by God. We are filled by God. We are so touched. And yet we take our blessing and we get in our car and we go home. Saints, it's time to start spilling God's blessings. There's a story, and I don't have a lot of time for stories right now. I've got to keep moving. But there were two pots. One of them was disfigured and leaked a little bit. The other was intact. And a person that bore water from a well every day took these two pots down, filled them up, and brought them back to be used in the home. And one pot was saying to the other one day, the crack pot was saying, you know, I just wished I was like you. I wish that I could hold everything that is put in me. I wished I could contain the, the water for this family. And the whole pot turned and said, well, why would that be? Do you not see the Flowers that have grown between the well and the house because of your leaks. Are we pouring out God's glory? Are we crackpots for Jesus? I know that sounds silly, but saints, there's some truth to that. Don't just take what you have and squash it down and hold on to it. Pour it out. In verse 11, Now as the lame man who was healed held to Peter and John, all the people ran together to meet them in the porch which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So once again now, he's holding on to the, these two guys. And, 
<laughs> I don't know how that is. They say that if you do a word study, this holding on right here is like, like an embrace. It's like he's got a hold of these guys and he isn't letting go for love nor money. And he is hilarious. He is so very blessed. But now he's looking to them. And now others are gathering to them. And I so love that Peter does what he does so well. He brings them back to Jesus. He doesn't bring attention to himself. A great servant of God does not stand on top of the mountain and tell you what he sees. He shows you the way up so you can see it for yourself. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, verse 12, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why do you so intently look at us? As though by our own power of godliness, we had made this man walk. We've seen this now again, and we're going to see it throughout Peter's ministry, that whenever people are trying to uh, glorify him or look to him or to John, remember John's involved in this too, they're, they're going, it's not about us. It's about Jesus. Saints, sometimes when people see the glory of God, the gifts of God over us, they start to hold us in a place we have no business being. When we pass through people's lives, let us leave behind the aroma of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the, so doing, then they learn not to depend on us, Not to depend on some benevolence from someone coming to a house of worship, but truly to depend on the one who moved the hearts to worship in the first place. Let us move through lives, leaving behind the aroma of the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 3 and now verse 13. And so now Peter is, is once again now redirecting people's attention away from himself, away from John, away from the apostles, even away from this man, except that he would be an example. And in verse 13, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, he's speaking to Jews. He's speaking to people who had come up on the the temple mount and gathered at the beautiful gate. And then to the Gentiles that may have been in the court of the Gentiles, And he's saying these are people that would have been coming to the Jewish faith. And he says, this is the God of our fathers, glorified his servant, Jesus. So God's glory now poured out over his son, fulfilled in these promises, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate. So now he's in indictment. He's he's setting an indictment before them. Let me continue on. When he was determined to let him go, but you denied the Holy One and the just. Looking at this very carefully, I want you to go back and, 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 um, and look at this. It says, he glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up. We've talked about this often, but without that conviction, not condemnation. Peter wasn't condemning them. He was saying, you're guilty of this. And as they acknowledge that, remember in chapter 2, it says they were cut to the heart. They were literally laid open by the word of God, by the truth of God. And they said, what must we do? And Peter said, you need to be to repent and to be baptized because of your repentance and the forgiveness of sin. You delivered him up and denied in the presence of Pilate. You guys remember in in, in Matthew chapter 27, uh, Pilate and in John, th- at least two or three times in, in John, I think 17, 18, 19, Pilate tries to step away from this situation. And in Matthew chapter 27, uh, verse 19, it says, While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with that just man. Just is innocence of a crime. He was just. He had committed no crime. As a matter of fact, Pilate would say, I find no fault in this man. 
But the woman would go on to say, For I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. The Lord had spoken in a dream to this woman who would stand in testimony to her husband that Christ was innocent. And Pilate says, I'm going to wash my hands of this situation. Why? Because the Jewish nation said, we want Barabbas. What do I do with Jesus? Pilate asked. Crucify him. He was determined to let him go, but you denied the Holy One and the just. Interesting term there. Uh, The Holy One in in Isaiah. It's interesting. Holy, holy, holy is used in Isaiah proclaiming God's glory by the angels. Isaiah is recording what angels are proclaiming. I'm going to say that again. Isaiah is recording what angels are proclaiming. And that term is used more in the book of Isaiah than any other book of the Bible. And it's holy, holy, holy. As a matter of fact, go over to Isaiah chapter 6. And those of you who know me know this is one of my favorite passages. And uh, this Bible here uh, is not earmarked yet, uh, but it will be soon. But in Isaiah chapter 6, written about 700 years before Christ, when the year that King Uzziah died, um, one of the great kings of Israel, and uh, my pages are not doing what I'm wanting them to do. But let's look at this, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim, each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, with two he flew, And one cried to the other, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And the whole earth is filled with his glory. I think what we see there is Holy Father, Holy Son, and Holy Spirit. Holy, holy, holy. The angels are proclaiming the goodness of God. And here in verse 14, But you denied the Holy One. And the just, remember that just being someone who is innocent of crime, and ask that a murderer be granted to you. And you killed the prince of life. You know, at this moment, guys, I want to be able to do this in such a way that you get a picture. We have gone from pandemonium to pin drop silence. We've gone from walking and leaping and praising God to you could hear a feather move. And the reason is Peter now proclaims God's glory in Christ Jesus. And you killed the prince of life. The prince of life, archaeos. He means the originator of life. God created us. He breathed life into us. It says in Genesis, God breathed life into Adam. When Jesus is speaking speaking to Nicodemus and saying, you must be born again, he was speaking of the breath of the Spirit to breathe life into us, a spiritual life. In this same book, in chapter 5, verse 31, God has exalted his right hand uh, to his right hand to be prince and savior. He had exalted Jesus to his right hand to be prince, that same word, archaeo, and savior, to give repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. We see this again in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. For it was fitting for him, for whom all things and by whom all were, are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain, archaeo, of their faith, salvation perfect through suffering. You understand that we just went from the absolute testimony of a man healed by God to now the truth that we all need to be healed. That we're all sitting and waiting. You may be there today. We've talked about Romans chapter 10 that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart. But saints, 
understand that as we work our way through the Word of God, there are 1,189 chapters that speak of God's goodness, of His mercy, of His grace. In Romans chapter 12, and I'm going to go over there real quick, and we've used it before. I'm sorry, not Romans, Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12, as we close this out this morning. Hebrews chapter 12. I, I believe this guy could have wrote this. I believe, I believe this man who had sat at the gate, who we don't even know his name, could write Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that has been set before us. See, he could have he wrote that. How many years after he was touched was the book of Hebrews written? I don't know. Who wrote it? I don't know. I know that the Lord had his hand in it. But this man could have said this because he said, look at me. Look at me. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Verse 2, Hebrews 12, looking to Jesus, the author, same term there, archaeo, and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Who are you trusting in this morning? Why are you here? Are we simply here to receive something to get us another day? Or are we here to see eternity changed? To align ourselves with the Lord of heaven and earth? Let's pray. Father, I love you. And there was a great man many years ago who said, Lord, fill my mouth with lots of good stuff and nudge me, Lord, when I've said enough. And uh, thank you for the patience of these saints. And Lord, we do pray this morning that if there are any who do not know you, that Lord, though they may be like this man, expecting a provision for a moment, Lord, I pray that they would see there is provision for eternity in the precious blood of your Son. Lord, from the cross you said it was finished. The veil was torn. The ark was gone. We need you. We need your mercy. We need your grace. And we trust in it. Lord, as you bring us back together again, tangibly, uh, physically with one another, help us to never forget what you've done in our lives at this time and at this place. Let us remember how precious it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. Lord, touch your saints this day. In the name of Jesus Christ and the saints of God said, Amen. Now, if you've received Christ as Lord and Savior, and we talk about this every week, but you need to get with somebody and let them know. That's a tough part of doing a video ministry is I don't know where you're at. But if you are walking closer to God, let somebody know. If you, this is your day, then dance before the Lord. Dance before the Lord in the beauty of His holiness, but do it in the presence of His saints. God bless you and have a great week. the Lamb of Wesley, holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat.
mercy. Say that again. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on. King of kings, you are my everything, and I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing, praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. 